sovereignty of the UK and England, and nobody like him uh, really standing up to Herman von Rumping and the other scallywags there in the EU dictatorship. He's elected out of England there to the EU parliament, which has no authority. Upwards of 80% of their laws are made by the dictatorship. Greece is in flames. The heads of the EU admit it's a takeover. Uh, he's got breaking news uh, with a, uh, a member of the Greek government that, that told him something that he's going to break here. He'll also give us his take on Ron Paul. Nigel Farage, or Farage, uh, joins us from UKIP.org from England. Thank you so much for giving us time, sir. Good to have you uh, there with us. On There's a big story going on here, Alex, and people need to know about it. There is. You've got the floor. Tell us what's going on in Greece. Well, as you all know, we've got this project called the Euro, where a whole series of different economies were forced together, and the ambition was that once you had a single currency, you would be able to forge a new state, a new state of Europe, regardless of the fact that we all speak different languages and have different cultures, but this was the plan. Many of us from the start warned that this simply economically could not work uh, because there wasn't actually a government for Europe. And what is happening inevitably is that the north and the south of Europe are dividing into two because of their different economies. And now what we've got is a European Union which is behaving not in an undemocratic way but in a deliberately democratic way. They have removed the elected Prime Minister of Greece and replaced him with one of their own puppets. And even a country the size of Italy, their Prime Minister has gone and been replaced by a former EU commissioner. And now what's happening is we're pushing upon these people austerity measures that are driving them into depression. You know, I know that the economies in the States and in England haven't been great the last couple of years. If I tell you now that, that, that in Greece, we have had five consecutive years of the economy contracting, and the fourth quarter figures for 2011 have just come through to show that that decline is now accelerating. It is now running at 7% per annum. That is the shrinkage in the Greek economy. And the people are getting to the state where, frankly, um, about a quarter of the population in Greece can barely afford to feed themselves, and people are now taking to the streets. And on Sunday, 80,000 people in Athens tried to storm the parliament. There were 5,000 police that were put in position using CS gas and everything else to stop them and to keep them out of the parliament. Uh, but 10 major buildings in the centre of Athens burned. This is getting very, very serious. And my fear, my great fear, is that if we go on treating Greece like a colony with its pride stripped, its democracy gone, with it being run by unelected bureaucrats, I think the result of this will be a revolution, and I really mean that. I mean, how much more obvious, uh, sir, does it have to get until we realize the, the euro is run by these big mega banks and admits it's trying to take over people's sovereignty, and no matter how many bailouts there are, the countries only go deeper into debt, and that now these technocrats are being put in charge over all these countries. I mean, how much will Europe put up with? Well, that's a good question. And, of course, when we talk about the bailouts, remember that all we're doing is we're giving the Greek government money so that it can pay it back to the banks that stupidly lent them the money in the first place. So none of this bailout money is actually helping the Greek people at all. And despite this dramatic fall in living standards, um, the current terms, and I have to say these are German-dominated terms, whether one likes it or not, that's the truth, and the current terms are for a cut of another 22% um, of all the public sector employees. Uh, we saw the 80,000 people in Athens, there were all tests going on in every single major Greek city and town. Um, and, and, you know, you get to a point, you get to a point where you say, just, you know, what, what else can people do? I mean, if you can't change your future through the ballot box, violence is the only resort you have left. Now, they deployed 5,000 police, as I just mentioned on Sunday. The Greek prime minister said, we will not tolerate this behavior. Um, but there is one encouraging sign that has come out. And that is a statement that was issued earlier on today by the Greek Police Federation, um, who said they were unhappy about some of the tactics being used. So you see, the point is this. If the Greek police force, in the end, refuse to take these orders, um, then there will be a revolution that will tear down the very fabric of this whole elected puppet government. Uh, the trouble is,
surprise, Alex, that, you know, when these things happen, it tends to result in quite a heavy loss of life as well. So I'm not, uh, I'm not pessimistic in the sense that I, I think these plans for, you know, this, this sort of new order um, of government where bureaucrats take over from Democrats, um, I think in the end the people are going to rebel and bring it down, but it may happen at a terrible, terrible time. Now, you, of course, helped found the UKIP party, and now it's the fastest growing party uh, in the UK. Your ideas of, of basic liberty, pretty much libertarian, uh, you know, school of thought, basic freedom, Magna Carta, really 1776 type ideas is now spreading o over Europe. And when I say you are now the Ron Paul, not just uh, of England or the UK, but uh, you're seeing now more and more uh, in in Europe itself as a focal point because you boldly have accurately called exactly what the EU bureaucracy was going to do. But now the EU bureaucracy themselves are saying we've got to have a carbon tax on all aircraft for a global government, new world order. Now Ban Ki-moon is saying global tax, world government. Uh, now Germany is saying, yes, no single family dwellings now to be built uh, uh, under carbon taxes. I mean, these are real authoritarians I see articles out of England where they're saying the state will take control of all children at birth and to keep your children will be probationary. I mean, it's like 1984. How much more obvious does this EU world government tyranny have to get? Uh, and what's your prognosis on, on, on how long they can keep going? Because it's just naked, naked control freak tyranny at a cartoon yeah. level. Well, there are two things that are going to break it, as I say, in those Mediterranean countries. And, and just have a think about this statistic. Youth unemployment in those Mediterranean countries is now 50%. 50% of young people unemployed. The deflationary death spiral of 7% contractions annually um, in the economies of these countries. So, I, I, you know, the cat's out of the bag. I think people are waking up. Um, what we're really waiting for, I think in many of these countries, we need some more strong leaders to emerge. We need some people with clear thinking. We need some people that understand that democracy and liberty are things that are so vital and important in a free country that indeed our grandparents actually went to war to defend those very principles that are now being surrendered. And the other thing in the end, I think, that might break it too are the markets. Because whatever they try and do in Europe, and they say, oh, well, it's all the speculators, it's all the speculators. But what the bond markets reflect is that investors realize that these countries are basically going bankrupt. And it's all well and good. They can bail out Greece. They can turn Greece into a colony. They can do the same with Portugal. Small countries. But remember, the question that is now being asked is what about Italy too? Italy is a big country in European terms with 62 million people. It's one of the biggest countries in Europe. And it seems to me uh, that when the bond markets take flight in Italy, and I, I confidently predict that will happen, uh, then, you know, however much money they print, whatever kind of Ponzi scheme uh, they try and come up with, I think the Italian problem may prove to be just too big to them. So it could end, it could end in financial chaos as well. All right. Now, again, I'm not just, uh, you know, here praising you for no reason. Your debates, your discussions, the articles you've written going back years are all there on record. You accurately predicted what is now happening in Spain and Portugal and Italy. You predicted what would happen in Ireland. Everybody's seeing that globalism is, is, is death uh, to a country. But we're also learning that most of this debt is the government signing on to the big mega banks debt. And the mega banks are using the crisis to try to shut down all their competition. Uh, they're trying to 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 move the power to Frankfurt, as you've exposed. So there's this major internal power struggle going on in the elites. We saw your own prime minister go from being a cheerleader for the Euro takeover of what's left of the UK to now having to reverse himself. I want to ask you uh, uh, why he did that, and and uh, what does that move signify? Well, David Cameron uh, went to a summit before Christmas, and if you remember, he was supposedly going to veto this new European treaty, this fiscal union treaty. Um, I, 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 the truth of it is, he was a reluctant hero. He didn't really want to do that. Uh, but the financial transaction tax that was being proposed would have meant Britain paying 80% of the bill, and it would have closed down our biggest single industry. Um, and, you know, one of the...
that in Britain. We're good at financial services. I don't mean mega banks. I mean the insurance industry. I mean the investment fund industry. I mean the foreign exchange industry. Cameron was a reluctant hero, uh, but they've managed to drop that proposal, and he is now he is now collapsed, and he is now supporting openly the plan for democracy to be abolished across the whole of Europe, and people like my old friend Herman Van Rompuy to become effectively unelected dictators. Cameron, believe you me, guys, Cameron is part of the problem, not part of the solution. He supports carbon taxes. He's a total believer uh, that we need supranational organisations uh, to to, you know, control our industries and our output. Um, and Cameron, Cameron is, in fact, disappointing now. I think millions of right-minded, conservative, Eurosceptic, patriotic voters in Britain and the Conservative Party in Britain is in real crisis now. All right, expanding on the mood in Britain, the mood in the United States, the mood in Europe, people are waking up to the New World Order, but these, these, these bureaucrats are not even disagreeing with you. They're saying in The Economist magazine and Rumpy and the new head of the EU are all saying, yes, we're going to set the rules and you can't vote on it. Yes, we're going to send tax collectors into your country. Yes, we're going to do whatever we want. And yes, uh, so, so, so instead of denying it, they're just giggling wildly when I watch these debates on C-SPAN or on YouTube and, and, and laughing at you and, and, and looking like you know, miscreant villains out of a Bond movie. Why, why are they so arrogant, and will it backfire on them? They're arrogant because they hold the cards at the moment. You know, they, they are in possession of the status quo. It is the tyranny of the status quo. But you're quite right about their arrogance. I, this afternoon, I, I, I met Mr. Monty, who is, who is now the appointed Prime Minister of Italy. And he was effectively just sticking two fingers up to us and saying, look, I'm in charge, whether you like it or not, this is the way that it's going to be. So there is a sort of a, a, a mood of hubris amongst these people uh, going around at the moment, but uh, I still believe that Nemesis will follow because the markets, the markets will break them and the peoples of Europe, the peoples of particularly the Mediterranean, you're going to see revolutions, Alex. I mean it. I mean it. You're going to see mass movements that bring these governments down. You cannot drive people into hopeless poverty. You cannot remove them of their pride and self-respect and not get a massive reaction. And I think what we saw in Athens on Sunday with those, with those I mean, you know, anyone that's seen the TV pictures, they're incredible pictures. I mean, here is this ancient capital of Greece, you know, the country that invented democracy, um, and, and much of it going up in flames. And as far as I'm concerned, you ain't seen nothing yet, because these new proposals are so bad that you, you, know, you, you push people too far, they will respond and react. I would rather this didn't have to happen. I would rather we had proper democratic solutions, but I'm afraid the bad guys have possibly just got too much power now uh, for any, anything other uh, than, some, than some massive social upheaval bringing it down. Well, everybody uses Hitler as an analogy, but you've got to use it if it fits. You talked about Europe militarily trying to take over uh, Russia and England, uh, Britain, and you know Hitler turning east like Napoleon. Now these bureaucrats have that same megalomania, power mad hubris, and they're going wild. And they're you know they're telling Greece we're going to take even private pension funds. They're now announcing that here, take part of them. They're telling Portugal that. Now your own pension fund is supposedly welfare while saying, you know, you have to live under austerity, but then the governments themselves are stealing trillions of dollars to give it to their friends. They're the ones that are really on corporate welfare. And so uh, it's just all coming to a head. And you mentioned that you met with a member of the Greek government. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, tell folks that story. Well, let me tell you this story. Last week, I was in Brussels, um, and I got a request from, from a guy, could he come and see me? Um, an elderly man in his middle, late 70s, with a very distinguished career behind him. Uh, this guy had been a Greek ambassador to several major countries around the world, and he'd even, on, on behalf of the Greek government, negotiated, back in the early 1980s, Greece's membership of the European community. So I'm talking about somebody here who is a, a real establishment figure. Um, in Greece, and, and, and a very charming and a very nice man in many ways. And what he told me frightened the life out of me. He said to me, Nigel, I've got to tell you um, that at the weekend, um, I went down to the back streets of Athens, and I bought myself a Kalashnikov. 
And I looked at him and I sort of blinked a bit and thought, did I hear that right? He said, yes. He said, I've got to tell you that uh, myself and my friends, those of us that are comparatively well off, we live in the, uh, on the outskirts of Africa, we live in big detached houses, and we're all going down and for 100 euros buying Kalashnikovs because we believe the time is close when we're going to have to defend our property. So desperate are the ordinary poor people for food and possession. And when you think about, you know, somebody, somebody of that social status who is so scared he's buying a Kalashnikov to defend his family, you realize that we've actually got in some of these countries, uh, we are on the edge. We are literally on the edge of a total breakdown in society. And, you know, I'm sure there are some big banks and big industrialists who perhaps are rubbing their hands and saying, well, the sooner Greece goes bankrupt, the better, because we can buy up the shipyards and buy up the islands and buy up the land. Uh, but, but the sheer price in human suffering, um, I something that, frankly, the world's, the world's normal, formal media is not giving the right level of attention to. Well, the globalists are going to have a lot of trouble ever getting away with this. I mean, that's the problem. They're committing such huge crimes. Look what they did in Argentina uh, 12 years ago. They've done this over and over again. And the worst part is they then scapegoat capitalism and blame it when this is not capitalism doing this. This is bureaucratic, crony insiders robbing everyone. Yeah, I mean, it's almost a new form of communism, isn't it, really? You know, if you think about it, um, it, is, it is the state and the big banks wanting to control absolutely everybody's lives. They couldn't give a damn about how much human suffering and misery they cause. They're stripping away that the, the basic fundament of liberty, of democracy, of all, all the things that we in the West um, have held dear for years. Um, and, and, and I have to say that for many, many years over here, I was a very lonely voice. Uh, but I tell you what, I'm hearing more voices now. Uh, and there are more people, even amongst the political class, who are now having the courage to stand up and say things. Amazing. Nigel Farage, one last segment with you. We'll be back with some other key questions straight ahead. All right, final segment. I could talk to this guy for 10 hours. He's a hard guy to get on with. He, he, he was just meeting with the, with the new appointed dictator of Italy uh, right before he got on the show. So, uh, but uh, here he is with us, the Ron Paul of uh, Britain and now uh, of Europe. I mean, really emerging as the main focal point leader along with UKIP, UKIP.org. If folks want to get involved with a true group fighting for a sovereignty against this global tyranny. We were talking during the break about him surviving a horrible freak plane crash that the pilot's still in really bad shape from and, and how suspicious that was. But hopefully they won't have a second one because then it will really be obvious. Uh, we were talking about getting out of the euro, but you were pointing out during the break it's designed as a fraud and, and, and so it's like impossible to get out of unless people just wake up to the fraud. Yeah, I mean, these guys that set this European project up were very, very clever, very, very devious people. And they wrote the treaties in such a way uh, that you were designed to get into the thing, but never, ever to be able to get out of the thing. It's rather like a lobster pot or a crab pot. There's a nice juicy bait, and you can get into the pot easily, but getting out is impossible. So th th there are no provisions. In the, Euro, in the European treaties for any country ever leaving the Euro. That is how they set this whole thing up. Um, these are bad people, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, these treaties should be declared null and void because, you know, the most massive fraud has been perpetrated upon the peoples of Europe. Um, and and, and I, think, I think the great public, you know, in France and in Germany, the ordinary people are beginning to wake up to what's been done in their names. Ron Paul, uh, what's your perspective on how the, the media has been ignoring him and demonizing him? It's fascinating. I, I must say, uh, the more I listen to and the more I read uh, what Ron Paul has to say, uh, the more fascinated and, and the more respect I have for this guy, because this guy's got courage. He understands that people want to be set free from big government, um, and he's not, you know, he's, he's, he's not scared of taking on any issue at all. And, you know, I watch him. There was, a, there was one of the uh, primaries the other day where Ron Paul got 27%, an amazing figure. And yet the BBC virtually refuse to even admit the fact that he's actually contesting the race. And, and, and I understand that many 
conventional parts of the US media have been the same. And it's kind of, you get a Ron Paul figure that comes along and challenges basic assumptions. And perhaps, to some extent, I've tried to do some of the same things over on this side of the Atlantic. And it's like a media blackout. So I, I just admire Ron Paul. He's worked hard at this for years. And whilst he's not going to become the president, I think the ideas that he's sowing in America, and particularly amongst the younger generation, uh, those ideas will survive long after Ron Paul. All right, in closing, sir, and I'm uh, again been honored to have you with us uh, right after your meeting with the uh, dictator of Italy. Is the tide turning? Has it turned, or are we close to turning it? I mean, where would you put us on a timeline? Because I, I mean, now you can see the euro collapsing. It's being talked about more, or will it just collapse into something even worse? We are now entering in Europe the single most dangerous period uh, that we've been in since 1945, and I don't say that lightly. This is because as the project fails, the determination of its authors to maintain the project becomes greater. We've already seen them do things that nobody could have believed. The removal of elected prime ministers in Greece and Italy perhaps being the best example of that. Um, I even wonder, you know, I even wonder if, if in the end the Greek police force uh, won't put down their own citizens, whether the EU itself might even move a force in. These people are bad people. They are capable of virtually anything. But however strong their determination to keep this thing going, the fact is that the fundamentals, the economic fundamentals say that in the end the global markets are going to break it and there is going to be the most massive rebellion across Europe. In some countries, it will manifest itself in the ballot box. In other countries, it will manifest itself, as I've said already tonight, um, in some kind of revolution that will take place. I think, I, I have to say, all the years I've been in politics, I think in terms of Europe and its future, uh, 2012 is the key crucial year. I believe, if I have to make a prediction, I believe, however hard they try, that Greece will leave the euro this year. She will go back to the drachma, she'll have a devaluation, her economy will start recovering, and then the Portuguese will say, we want out too, and the Spanish will say, Incredible, we want out incredible. Okay, we've gone into overdrive with Nigel Farage, of course, a member of the European Union Parliament, uh, the main leader of uh, the UK Independence Party. And uh, just an amazing individual who, if you haven't, the reason I'm a big fan, and I'm talking about big fan, like people are soccer fans or football fans, I'm a fan of people kicking globalists hind in. And they hate him when he gets up there to those sniveling slime bags like Rumpy. He's been censured or threatened with censure as well. But, but he was finishing up with his um, prediction. So recap that and finish up, sir. Well, I think 2012 is going to be the single most important year that we've seen in Europe, certainly in the time that I've been involved in politics. Everything is coming to a head. These guys will do everything they can to try and defend their Euro project and to try and keep their big government project going, but they're having trouble with the markets, they're having trouble with the peoples of Europe as they were in Athens standing up and rebelling. Predict that in 2012, Greece will leave the euro. And once one country has left the euro, had a devaluation, and, and other countries see that suddenly, with a currency at the right level, suddenly investment starts to come in, people start going on holidays to their country. I think then we'll see countries like Portugal, Ireland, Spain, and possibly even Italy saying to themselves, hey, we've been sold a pup here, this thing's a con, we've got to get our currencies back, we've got to get our democracies back. I am confident that 2012 will mark the beginning of the end of this appalling, disgusting project. Wow. So when you met, uh, just briefly, when you met with Mario today, the, the technocrat yeah. installed by the EU uh, weasels, I mean, what did he say to you? What, what did you ask him? I said he had no legitimacy at all, uh, that he was an appointee, uh, that he'd spent his life as a European commissioner and working for Goldman Sachs, and that he represented all that was worth in this whole new global government movement that you talk about so often on your program. And his response is that uh, the crisis is so serious that democracy has to be suspended just for a short while so that we can sort everything out. You know, we've seen, haven't we, in the past, countries that claim emergency powers. Hitler did it in Germany, suspended democracy because of an emergency and never, ever gave it back. And I don't think these guys have any intention of giving democracy back and say, we the people have got to take it from them. It could be turbulent, it could be difficult, some of it could be unpleasant, but it's a fight we've got to fight. And I think we've got to remember that those that went before us, who, who actually created democracy, liberty, and freedom of the individual, these guys, 
people are actually prepared to go to war to fight to defend these things, we, I'm afraid, are going to have to do much the same kind of thing. All right, we've only got a minute left. Again, we appreciate your time. Uh, was this... Uh on the floor was this videoed because i know they're admitting we're getting rid of freedom but but i mean to, you know to have them publicly admitting it to you or, or was this privately no this was privately and it's always a combination here you know you get the chance on the floor to speak to these people uh, but sometimes meeting them in private is more interesting and I, I had a very interesting meeting with angela merkel in november i said chancellor merkel this isn't working German taxpayers are putting huge amounts of money in to bail out the banks uh, through, through the Greek government. Wouldn't it be better for everybody to admit that the euro is a failure and to let Greece leave? She said, Mr. Farage, we can't do that because if Greece leaves, all the others will leave. And if they all leave, the European project will fail. And then we'll just go back to being nation states from their own mouths. Unbelievable. And choice and sovereignty and honor. Uh, incredible. Uh, so, so is the arrogance a, a act like with Al Gore, or do you think they're still delusional? I mean, are you seeing a change in their spirit uh, as they lose momentum? Interestingly, six months ago, there was a sort of feeling of blind panic over here. Everything was going wrong. They were terrified, and, and you could see the fear on their faces. I'm not seeing any fear at all now. It's as if perpetual crisis has become a new form of government, and they now realize they can, that they can actually get away with almost anything. At least they think they can get away with anything. For a country the size of Italy to have somebody like this man, Monty, appointed to take it over, and for that to have happened, they are completely out of control. Well, it's not the first time they had Mussolini. Uh, Nigel Farage, thank you so much for the time. Yeah, UKIP.org. Uh, God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, folks, there he goes. Amazing. Key info coming up. And then back tonight, 7 o'clock Central. Don't forget, I'm speaking in Dallas this weekend. Info at infowars.com forward slash events so uh, you can still get tickets to that all right incredible visit infowars.com and prisonplanet.com when you're on the site you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast there's also a free iphone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want <laughs>